etc. So the function of the kidney is to remove waste and produce urine. That urine is the product that's filtered and processed blood plasma. Essentially, it's product of filtered and processed blood plasma, starting at gl the glomerulus through filtration. Okay? Usually it's sterile it's, unless it's contaminated with some microbes that, from the outside, whether they are in the kidney or in the urinary tract. All right, so ideally, urine that is expelled from the body should be sterile. Okay? If you let it stand there, it will uh, accumulate um, microbes. It will also accurate, uh, develop a certain smell, a pneumonia type smell. All right, and there's some characteristic that you did in lab, and we're not going to go too, too much in depth through them. Composition, volume, right, how much you produce, the pH, specific gravity. Specific gravity is a density marker, right? The more dense or more, the higher the specific gravity, the more dense the solution, meaning that it has more stuff in it, so, right, stuff dissolved in it, right? So if I have a certain glucose solution, Water, an aqueous glucose solution, it's going to have a higher specific gravity than water, right? Because it has more sugar in it. Okay, here you have urea, you have, uh, you might have glucose, you might have protein, right? The more stuff in the solution, the higher the specific gravity. Okay, color and turbidity, color, to, whether it be, it be from clear to a dark yellow, almost a uh, golden color, right? And that's indicative of hydration status, right? And then you have uh, smell, we talked about turbidity is whether it's cloudy or not. Clear, cloudy, is there any stuff in it, right? So proteins, uh, white blood cells, bacteria will make the urine appear cloudy. So on average, your composition is about 95% water, 5% solutes, <laughs> includes salts, wastes, Hormones, some drugs, ketone bodies, etc. Okay, and so I'll, you know, I'm going to show you the table in a second, the next page. All right, Vol volume about one to two liters per day on average. All right, that's probably what a minimum. At minimum, you need to produce at least half a liter of urine per day. Less than that, and your body is not going to be able to remove the waste that it needs to remove. And then what happens? Where do those wastes accumulate? In the blood. And that can cause a lot of problems. So when you have renal failure, you're not producing this, this amount. Wastes accumulate in the blood, and that's why you have to go through dialysis. And that's not, that's not coincident with life. Okay, here's um, factors that influence urine volume, right? ADH, aldosterone, they will increase the amount of urine produced. Decrease in H, uh, AMP, atrial and atriatic peptide. Decrease fluid intake, decrease blood pressure, right? You know, or increase in other fluid output, sweating, vomiting, diarrhea, hemorrhage, right? And then you see these are opposite. Questions on urine production, right? So one of my favorite things to do in life is to play baseball. All right, and I was lucky enough to play baseball in college for a little while. And then in grad school, I found an adult uh, men's baseball league in Florida. And that was really fun because I got to play during the summer. Well, what are Florida summers like? Miserable. They're hot and humid, okay? And then on top of that, my favorite position to play is a catcher. Catcher wears a helmet and a bunch of other equipment, okay? So one nice day in Florida. One nice weekend, we are out playing baseball at like 10 o'clock in the morning. Awesome. The game gets over about 12.30. Awesome. And then the coach of the team says, oh, by the way, we have to make up that other game. So we're going to play another game right now at 12.30. Okay, sure. Two hours later, I played about six and, six and a half, seven hours of, of baseball nonstop, 95 degrees. 90% humidity. Um, I sweat through not only my uniform, my undershirt underneath the uniform, and the chest protector that was, I was wearing. The sweat was dripping off of the chest protector. The grossest thing I've ever done, okay? 
the urine I produced that night was, was like, I, it was almost solid. Okay. Right. But the point of it is, it was, it was dark, dark yellow. I'm, produ- I'm losing lots of fluid, sweating. I can't get in as, I didn't get in as much fluid. I didn't drink as much fluid as I should have. Okay. What do you end up with? Decreased, right? Increased ADH, increased aldosterone to help reabsorb the water that, that's going through the filtration, through glomerular filtration, and I'm trying to get it all back as much as possible. It's so super, super concentrated, kind of looks like orange juice. Okay? And I think I, I don't think I recovered for two days after that. It was, it was a tough, tough time. All right? So once urine is produced, it is transported from the kidney <coughs> to the bladder through the ureters, okay? In essence, these are tubes. These are muscular tubes that are going to contract muscle to kind of through peristalsis, milk urine from the renal pelvis into the bladder, okay? So there's some mucosal folds and the muscularis layer, all right? So you have really four layers <coughs> or three layers of, of tunics, three layers of tissue uh, in the ureter, all right? Mucosa muscle and then the serosa adventitia on the outside. The kidney is retroperitoneal and much of the ureter is also retroperitoneal and then it comes into it, it crosses over the peritoneum and then into the bladder. Okay? These are distensible. That means they can expand. All right? In the case of urinary reflux, when the bladder contracts and urine is pushed back, they push back against the flow. And there's more than what normally, a higher volume than what the ureter normally contains. So the, ur- the, the ureter distends, okay? And it kind of um, expands. The ureters then enter the bladder, okay? So the bladder is a muscular um, container. Let's call it a container. All right, and both the ureter and the bladder have transitional epithelium that um, cover the in- interior lumen, the mucosa, in order to, preve- to protect the underlying cells from the urine that's, that's inside it, okay? Um, important part of this, the bladder has a, a distinct muscle, a dis- what we call the detrusor muscle, which will contract and push urine normally out of the urethra. Okay, um, bladders attach actually towards the posterior, sur- uh, the, excuse me, the ureters actually attach to the, uh, and enter the bladder towards the posterior surface and enter and produce uh, two holes along with the third, the third exit hole, the ure- urethra. Those three points produce a imaginary area called the, tr- the trigonum the trigony, however you want to um, pronounce it, all right? But it is an area which functions as a funnel to, put, to move urine and channel urine out of the urethra so that when the bladder does um, contract, okay, urine is pushed out and so that it, it allows for a complete voidance, right? Complete emptying of the bladder at urination. Okay. The bladder is moderately full at about 500 mils. Okay. You will get a reflex, an understanding or a feeling, a nervous stimulus to empty the bladder between, that'll start around 200 to 300 mils. Right? And the bladder is basically completely full at about 750 mils. Okay. In order to void the bladder, called urinate and mixture it we call micturition there are two sphincter muscles that have to be relaxed okay the bladder distends and you have baroreceptors within that that will um, sense the stimulus of stretch that'll send an impulse to the brain to void the bladder okay then the detrusor muscle contracts you have to relax the internal 
urethral sphincter and the external urethral sphincter in order to um, void. One of those, the external, is a voluntary, voluntarily uh, relaxed muscle. Okay, here's the difference in the urethra in men and women. Women, it is only a uh, conduit for urine, right? And it's much shorter, which has its advantages of boy, you are getting rid of urine quicker, I guess. The disadvantages, it is also um, the placement along the perineum um, also uh, brings up higher incidence of urinary tract infection. In men, it's much longer. It's also a conduit for urine and semen. All right, and there's a couple different parts of the urethra. You have the prosthetic urethra, the membranous urethra, and then the spongy urethra, which goes through the penis. All right, the prosthetic urethra is important. It actually passes through the prostate. The prostate is a, uh, a reproductive organ that um, um, contributes to the fluid, the seminal fluid, okay? But it actually wraps around the urethra and when it, uh, prostate cancer or benign prosthetic hyperplasia, that organ expands and that causes uh, stenosis or, or pinching of the urethra in that area. So it makes it more difficult to pee, right? It makes it more, uh, feel like you have to go more often, right? I don't know if any of you have seen the, the commercial of the two guys that are sitting there watching the baseball game. He's like, I gotta go again. And they start talking about their prostate in the middle of a baseball game. I don't know, whatever. All right. so, and he's like, oh, I took this medication and it helps with my, my, my BPA, all right? BPH, benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Okay. The problems with this, with this urinary tract from kidney, ureter, bladder, one of the biggest ones is kidney stones. Okay. So formed from crystalline materials building up in the kidney. So will there be calcifications or the fact that the ammonia or or the products of the urine, what's happening is actually um, the levels, the mineral levels are abnormal and causing a solidification, right? So the crystals are forming in the urine. And in most cases, in most cases, these renal calculi are not painful. In most cases, they're really small and they pass on their own, okay? Um, and you actually, some people can act, will actually see like, when they go to the bathroom, they, they urinate, they'll see like sediment, or it look like little like crystals at the bottom of the toilet. And that is indicative of uh, some small kidney stones that can be passed. All right, so it could be inadequate fluid intake, reduced urinary flow. I'm surprised I didn't develop kidney stones after my baseball experience, okay? Frequent urinary tract infections, all right, is also a, a possibility, right? Because the bacteria that are in there um, disrupt the chemical and the mineral levels in the urine. All right, most small stones are asymptomatic, asymptomatic, there we go. All right, these are more common in males. Um, larger stones, though, obstruct the kidney, the renal pelvis, and the ureter. They get stuck. That causes pain. A, a distinct pain we call loin to groin region. So from the middle back to the, to the inguinal groin area, kind of feel that radiating pain, right? I, I pulled a muscle in my back last semester and the first thing my doctor asked was like, are you producing urine? Blah, 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 drinking enough water? Because that was right. Anything in the lumbar back region, um, it, that's indicative of a kidney issue. Okay, now most of these pass on their own and you just kind of alleviate symptoms, take something for pain, increase fluids, right? Some that are big enough require a, either a surgery or to, they need to be broken up. Lithotripsy is the, nor, the first um, treatment for breaking up stones. Lithotripsy involves uh, you laying on in a chair or on the on a you know 
in the hospital bed, and they use an ultrasound probe to help break up the stones. So I'll put the probe along your kidney, right, to find where it was, and it, on the outside, it's not invasive, but that ultrasonic probe goes in and it, it, it uses sound waves to break up the stones, and then they're packed. And then also uteroscopy, right, so they'll go through the catheter, through the, the urethra, through the, through the bladder, up through the ureter, um, and then I look to see where the stones are or they could be removed that way, right? That is a more invasive um, procedure, okay? Urination or micturi micturition is the expulsion of urine from the bladder. And it just it basically is one of two things. You have a reflex to not go or you have a reflex to go. Go or no go. So you have a storage reflex. You're going to store urine, okay? The bladder's empty, right? This is usually a sympath this is a sympathetic nervous system stimulation, okay? So when you have a sympathetic nervous system uh, inputs, you're stressed, you're nervous, you're going to have this storage reflex. You're gonna actually retain water, right? This causes relaxation of, of the muscle to accommodate urine, also, uh, contraction of the internal urethral sphincter. The internal urethral sphincter is the involuntary one. Okay? So in this case, urine is retained. Now the external urethral sphincter is also contracted to retain urine, but that is through a different nerve that will uh, voluntarily close, keep that contracted. So that's what we call the storage reflex. All right, so here's your storage reflex, sympathetic nervous system, so your thoracic and sacral nerves, right? So thoracic nerves go to the bladder, and that is going to relax and allow this, um, the accumulation of urine in the bladder, okay? And then your, the nerve, the, pud the pudendal, pudendal nerve, right, goes to the external urethral sphincter, Keep it contracted so that voluntarily holding your okay so it's both a voluntary and an involuntary process sympathetic nervous system input storage reflex so what is the micturation reflex or the expulsion reflex the go is going to be what input if storage is sympathetic going is parasympathetic Okay, so your micturition reflex or your go reflex starts when the bladder is when the bladder is moderately really I say you could get this reflex at about 200 to 300 mils, but it is more likely it's going to be closer to 500 mils. Okay, the bladder in this case is distended. All right, and activate it in the bladder wall. Those baroreceptors are activated. So that's number one. These were numbered. So this would be, oh, let's go here. One, two, three, four. Okay? So the volume, the increase in, in urine volume stored extends <coughs> the bladder. That then sends a, 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 a stimulus that, the, that they're stretched there. Right? So sensory neurons are signaled by those, those baroreceptors that, that recognize the distension and the stimulate the, uh, the center, the brain and the pons to begin about going. Right? Those nerve signals then are, are sent down the spinal cord to the pelvic splenic nerves. Okay? And then you're, that then goes to the parasympathetic nervous system right, causes the, the, the detrusor muscles to contract, right, contract that cause decrease in volume of the bladder, pushes urine down in, through the trigony into the urethra, right, and then causes the internal sphincter to relax, and then you have to voluntarily release, uh, relax the external urethral sphincter and urine is passed out of the body. All right, so the numbers on the previous slide uh, coordinate with the numbers 
on here, right? So moderately full, all right? Impulse stimulus comes in, the, the muscles stretch, that's the stimulus. The micturition center sends the information down through the splenic nerves. That goes to, to contract the detrusor muscle, relax the internal uh, urethral sphincter, and then relax the external urethral sphincter, right, through the pudendal nerve. That then allows urine to be passed out of the body. Okay? Questions on micturition? Go or no go? Storage or go? All right, store or urinate? That's the inputs. Okay, and voluntary, voluntary control of urination can happen anywhere between, I don't know, <coughs> year and a half to, to you know, three years old. Um, most children don't have complete nighttime control until they're six, five, six, seven years old. Um, depending on their size. Um, some problems that you, common problems we have with the urinary tract are infections. These UTIs occur when bacteria or yeast enter the tract, <clears throat> okay, and they begin to multiply. Women are more prone because of the shorter urethra and the, it, where it is, uh, the proximity to the anus, um, especially if they wipe from back to front. You're supposed to wipe from front to back, okay? I say that because I had to teach my tutor how to do it, okay? If it's, uh, so often it first develops in the urethra, and that's urethri urethritis, all right? If it spreads to the bladder, it's cystitis, so now you have a bladder infection. It may spread up to the kidneys, which is pyelonephritis. Pylo means pus, okay? So pylo, that's a infection, a bacterial infection, nep any PHR that refers to nephron, that really refers to the kidney. Itis is inflammation of, so inflammation of the kidneys due to bacterial infection. Symptoms include painful urination or dysuria, frequent urination, the need to feel like they need to go, pressure in the pubic region. Um, it could cause you know, kidney pain, flank pain, uh, back pain, that loin to groin area uh, that we talked about usually diagnosed through urinalysis, treated with antibiotics, increased fluids, um, and a lot of times it's also associated with, you know, what, where they, where they come from. The type of bacteria that is causing the UTI is important. Most of these, I'd say 80 to 85% of uh, urinary tract infections are caused by E. coli, all right? E. coli that are usually in the, in the perineum region of the anus, all right? However, there are some cases where you end up with a staph, you, a staph aureus infection, all right? That's more associated with um, having catheters, um, any other type of, uh, usually urinary, urethral catheters that are placed um, in patients. That's usually like a secondary infection. My daughter had one that was a staph infection that she got from having a voiding cystourethrogram, all right, from the catheter placement. And that happens, but, you know, most of them are E. coli related. All right, other clinical imparts, impaired urination, all right, so you have basically two parts that are two different categories, incontinence, inability to regulate control urine release or retention the inability to eliminate normally so either you can't hold it or you can't get rid of it okay so incontinence maybe due to childbirth um, a strong detrusor muscle contraction secondary result of medication fear responses right there's a now my wife had two children not by vaginal birth both of them were, were born by cesarean section Okay, but all of her mom friends and all of our friends that have had kids, ladies, this is what you have to look forward to. Like after you have a baby by, by vaginal birth, like if you laugh the wrong way, right? You do a little bit of pee comes out. No joke, that's what happens. Like that's the running joke, okay? Um, but it, yeah, so you lose a little bit of that ability to retain 
um, and it happens. Um, retention, failure to eliminate, right? This is a, this is a symptom of, for men, for prostate enlargement, enlargement of the prostate, and it could cause you know, retention of the, within the bladder because the prostate's enlarged and can't pass through the urethra that way, right? Um, also, side effects from general anesthesia. How many of you have had um, a surgery where you had to go under general anesthesia? Okay. But when you woke up, what was the first thing that they asked you? Huh? How you feeling? Right? Okay, yeah. How you feeling? And when they're like, why are you going to go home? But you need to what? You have to urinate first. Okay? So, I like, that's always, like, I was always like, you can't go home until you go to the bathroom. Okay, on, under general anesthesia. So I had an arm, I had my arm fixed. Like I broke my arm when I was a freshman in high school, right? I had, I had some pins placed or whatever else. So I woke up and, you know, I'm like, all right, can I go home? I'm like, well, you have to go to the bathroom first. Okay, like I need to go, let's go. Okay, but and then years later, I had a wrist surgery, same thing. You gotta go to the, what's, because general anesthesia actually affects the nerves that are important for this, right? For this, they'll help you to move to store and retain urine, right? And if you can't get that to go, then they have to, you have to just wait a little while, right? It may incur in require a, a catheter to remove the urine or else it backs up and goes up to the kidneys and causes problems, right? Questions on urinary tract and, and micturition. No? Yes? All right, that covers the material that we'll have for your exam next week.